Welcome and thank you for being a listener of the Dose of Leadership podcast. Currently, we're expanding the conversations beyond just leadership into health, wealth, purpose, spirituality, relationships, and much, much more, because today's leader has to be about all of these areas to lead into the future. Hi, I'm Matt Lilly, and I'm the new host of the previous Dose of Leadership podcast, now called Bright Vibe. I've owned 20 businesses over the last 30 years, and I've studied business, wealth, health, strength, spirituality, you name it, I've studied it, and I've learned that you have to grow in all these areas to be the best well-rounded leader that you can be, not just at office, but also at home. We have an impressive lineup of speakers coming soon, so please stay tuned to the podcast. Thank you for being a listener and part of our Dose of Leadership community, and now we welcome and are excited to have you be a part of our Bright Vibe podcast community. So Patrick Dossett, welcome to the show today. So happy to have you on. Thanks, Matt. Great to be here. Well, I'm very passionate about the things that I think you're passionate about. So I was excited to have you come on the show today. And it sounds like we've got some commonality around some family stuff and other stuff. So I want to dive in. But the uh, part of the what you do currently, your day job and probably your night job and your waking up at the 3 a.m. job is, <laughs> is you're the president and CEO of a company called Made For, M-A-D-E-F-O-R. And I'm assuming it's madefor.com. Um, uh, yep, yeah, getmadefor.com actually. Oh, that's right. We, the madefor.com is owned by uh, I think a Spanish furniture company. Oh, okay, fair it. enough, <laughs> fair enough. Um, so you you've got a very interesting background, and then I do want to ask what is made for and, and what uh, what it does and how does it really help people? And and I've researched it quite a bit, so I do know some of the stuff you do there. But uh, obviously, an interesting part of your background is that at one point you were a Navy SEAL. Yeah, I, I really began my professional career serving as a, as a U.S. Navy SEAL. So I had the good fortune to go to the U.S. Naval Academy for college. And then mm-hmm. um, when I graduated in 2002, um, I got a slot to SEAL training. So uh, the first part of SEAL training is known as Basic Underwater Demolition School mm-hmm. and um, started with 220 really eager, very physically capable um, people that had worked hard to get to, to make it to SEAL training and ended up graduating with 17 out of that original 220. So wow. that was the, that was the start of my, my SEAL experience. Right. And it, I, and I've, you know, I've heard of, you can go do like SEAL training esque type training with SEALs. And we actually had some people, I live in Wichita, Kansas. We actually had some SEALs come in a couple of weeks ago. I didn't go to the event, but they had some, uh, you know, where you could go out and learn to shoot like a SEAL and, and do some stuff like that. So I know that that's, I have no idea how hard that training is. I'm assuming that that's very rigorous training and how long a process was that to get from 200 and some down to 17? Yeah, it takes about, um, seven months, I believe, to, to winnow that group down. So um, <clears throat> we started again with 220. About five weeks in, we were down to 150. The sixth week of SEAL training, at least at the time, was known as Hell Week, where oh. you stay awake for five and a half days and you're wet and cold and tired and moving around, running everywhere with boats and carrying telephone poles. Came out of Hell Week with 36. And like I said, the class went on to graduate 17 out of the out of the original 220 so wow that's that's just yeah I've heard, yeah and you know they have movies and everything with and they reference hell week and all that fun stuff but living it and seeing it on on a movie screen i'm sure is way way different um yeah you know i think i think it's just it's the i mean look there's no question seal training is hard uh there's no way to to skirt that but i would say that you know the attitude and the mindset that you bring to seal training um can make it impossible or it can make it doable and can make it even fun and rewarding at times. And so, um, you know, one way to look at it is that, you know, I'm going through this training pipeline that these, these, these people are getting paid to torture me for, <laughs> for almost, you know, eight months. Uh, right. The other way to look at it is I'm getting paid to work out on the beach in Southern California. And <laughs> life's pretty good and it's pretty simple and they're going to feed me and give me shelter. And um, so I think it's, it's all about your perspective going in. Sure. Definitely. And what made you want to, what made you want to get into the military in the first place? Or did you know that you kind of wanted to be a SEAL or was it something that once you got in the military, then you were like, Hey, I do want to, I, I want to see how far I can take this or kind of what was that thought, that thought process? Yeah. I had the good fortune of, um, early on, I believe I was in seventh grade. I, I came across a book. I think my uncle Peter gave it to me. It was called, um, Rogue Warrior. And so it was a book written by this gentleman named Dick Marcinko, who has uh, just passed away this uh, this past year, but very famous SEAL, um, big leader in our community. And it was the first time that I had ever heard about what SEALs were, what the SEAL teams were all about. And something in that book just connected with me, this, this young 13-year-old kid. I read this and I was like, wow, that sounds like the hardest 
possible thing you could do. It sounds like an amazing adventure, amazing people, and I want to do it. And so from that point forward, I really got just focused on this idea of, you know, one day becoming a SEAL. And um, I, you know, a little bit of serendipity when I was going through the the college list with a guidance counselor in high school, just going down and ticking off colleges. And I was thinking at the time that I might play football in college mm -hmm. and came across a school that said Navy. And I said, oh yeah, I want to be a SEAL Navy. That makes perfect sense. Let's do that. And as soon as I picked that, the, the counselor said, well, um, these other schools look great, but that school is actually really hard to get into and it probably is not going to work out for you. And so um, again, you know, no hill for a climber just got me hyper-focused on, let me figure out how to make this happen. And uh, you know, good luck and good fortune and some hard work and things lined up and I got accepted the Naval Academy. And for me, going in the military was, that was the path to becoming a SEAL. The Naval Academy was, I've got to do this for four years and then I'm going to get a spot to SEAL training and, and then I'll do what I want to do. So hmm. um, that's kind of how it happened. Thank you for listening to the Bright Vibe podcast today. We've got a special event coming up here shortly, July 12th through the 16th, called the Global Happiness Summit. And we're bringing resources from around the country together to talk about happiness and what that means and how to have more of that in our lives. Go to brightvibe.com, B-R-I-T-E, vibe, V-I-B-E.com for more information about the Global Happiness Summit. And we look forward to seeing you July 12th through the 16th. And so... Um, so you knew from a very young age, this was something you wanted to do. What, what was, what would, and, and I, we're going to get into the made for and what you do today, but what would people be surprised to know about, uh, I, I think as I, I'll, I'll just start from my own perspective. So from my own perspective, Navy SEALs are probably a lot of bravado, a lot of, a lot of like, you know, you, we can kick anybody's ass or, you know, I mean a lot, but what, would, what, would, what would surprise me about what, what would I be surprised to know about kind of Navy SEALs in general or the, the miss, uh, information, I guess, or the myths. Yeah. Um, I'd say the biggest maybe mythic narrative around the, uh, around SEALs and the SEAL teams is that, that these people are superhuman, that they are just, they're different than, than the average person person walking the street. And um, there's no question that SEALs um, have forged a mindset that allows them to perform at a very high level. Um, but that mindset has been forged through some very foundational practices. And what I would say is that, you know, all of the biggest, fastest, strongest people, at least in my SEAL training class, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I know this has been this has been played out in numerous other training classes all the biggest fastest strongest people those that maybe were born with natural god-given abilities or talents or you'd say hey that person most looks the part they're definitely going to make it they were some of the first to go away and so what you were left with at the end was this group of 17 rather unremarkable looking people <laughs> you wouldn't have been able to pick them out from the lineup right um they, they weren't the people that showed up to training with SEAL tattoos on their chest. They were these soft-spoken, um, understated, quiet professionals that um, that were able to lean into a mindset that allowed them to take their, their bodies and their brains to places maybe we wouldn't think are accessible. So, oh, Very interesting. And I thank you for that perspective because, yeah, that would have not been my stereotypical thought of a SEAL as far as being kind of more quiet or more introspective, it sounds like, or more able, to, I guess, to, to kind of even get to become a Navy SEAL, it sounds like you had to more than likely control your state, state change, I would think, um, and not become, uh, uh, not, not succumb to your circumstances, right? It would be like a professional athlete or something. You would have to be very focused, and I would think, know what the outcome is for you. Otherwise, you just don't make it, I'm assuming, right? You give up. Yeah, I, I, th I think that I think that's spot on. I mean, um, you take something like Hell Week, mm -hmm. people quit in the first five minutes of Hell Week. Oh, oh my There's gosh, is that bell. right? People are ringing the bell, and and the it's first not that five minutes. You, oh yeah, and it's not that you've done anything that was that challenging in the first five minutes. In fact, you've been in training for five or six weeks and yeah. there's no question you've been colder, tireder, um, you know, more physically exhausted, all of the things. You've already experienced that to a much higher degree than you experienced in the first five minutes of Hell Week. But um, I think what happens sometimes is people get started and it's very much like being on a roller coaster that's that's like clicking up the hill. And once it starts <laughs> like, clicking, I don't you realize it. like, oh, well, it's like, oh, wow, I can't get off this thing. Like now I'm going to be awake for a week. I've never right. done that. Um, I'm already starting 
a little bit under the weather. I'm sick. I've got overuse injuries. I'm cold. I'm tired. I'm broken, whatever the thing is. And you start projecting out um, over the entire course of the week and trying to solve for it in, you know, in just a few steps. And and that's impossible. It's just, it's like staring at the sun, you know, eventually the sun's going to win. And so um, for those people that are able to focus on what they can control and bring that finish line in a little bit closer and say, okay, the, the week is too much to think about but maybe i can focus on where's my swim buddy uh where's my boat crew can i take 10 more steps can i make it to the next meal can i make it to through this next evolution i mean that's the game that you get really good at playing and um, you find ways to to generate rewards and and build resilience as you're navigating something that uh, is incredibly challenging and so i think you're right that people that allow themselves to get overcome by their the circumstance or that allow themselves to focus on things beyond their control, um, they eventually decide that I can't continue, this is too much. And those that are able to uh, go at it from the opposite opposite end and focus on what they can control and um, break it up into bite-sized chunks end up doing, you know, doing well. And I think, you know, we talk a lot about on this show about kind of taking small steps is more important than one giant step because the one giant step probably doesn't stick and it's kind of like an anomaly versus just those one foot in front of the other, you know, each day, you know, accomplishing things each day is more important than trying to wait. You know, you're trying to accomplish some big goal that may be 10 years out. Well, that's not, you're going to lose motivation or you're not, you you need those wins, right? You need those daily wins or uh, weekly wins at least or monthly, right? It's those little celebrations that maybe nobody else is celebrating, but you are. It's just like, I used to be a long distance runner and, and, you know, a big part of that was like, you know, the next mile, right? I'm just going to make it to the next. I'm not focused on the finish line. I'm focused on getting through this next mile. And then I'll worry about the one after that, right? Or for me, yeah. it, for me, it was always the person in front of me. Well, I'm just going to I'm, I'm just going to try to get up to where they are right now. I'm not worried about the guy who's leading the race. I'm worried about the person in front of me. Can I just get to that person? And, and then that's my win. And then I can set a re, kind of reset the goal, if that makes sense. Um, and that's, so, that, that, that's it. Yeah, absolutely. And so, so then at some point you were, I think you were a Navy SEAL 12 years, did you say? Is that what you? Uh, no, I was uh, in, the, in the SEAL teams for just under 10 years. Oh, 10 years. Okay, years. 10 years. And so what was the transition or I guess why transition out of that? I know I, I, I have no clue. Is there kind of like an age out thing or is it just life circumstances? There, you know, there, there, I mean, there, there really isn't. It, it, it's a little bit different for officers and enlisted uh, mm-hmm. in, enlisted. Um, uh, service members can stay in the teams and, and continue to operate for as long as their bodies hold up for the mm-hmm. most part. Um, as an officer, and I was an officer, you eventually start moving out of the tactical leadership positions into more operational strategic roles. And um, I was getting to that point where I was starting to phase out of the tactical leadership side of things. And I knew at some point that I wanted to have a family and mm-hmm. I couldn't reconcile how I would have a family and be in the SEAL teams and give everything that that job uh, requires of us that I couldn't do both really well. And so for me, that was started to be the impetus of, of deciding to, to make the transition out. And I would say that it doesn't matter if you leave at five years or 10 or 25, leaving that community and the, and the teams is, is really, really hard. And it probably applies, you know, across any profession, but I think especially in the, in the military profession that you get used to working on really difficult mission sets alongside a group of committed individuals that are selfless, that are always putting the team above self. And um, for me, you know, since I was 18, I essentially grew up in the military. So that was all I knew. I did like, this is how the world works and this right. is how people perform. And, um, and that was hard to let go of. But the thing that allowed me to transition out with, you know, make the transition a little bit easier is that I recognized at some point that I love jumping and diving and shooting and blowing things up and like <laughs> traveling. Like all of that stuff is a lot of fun. Right, of course. What I love, what I love most about the teams is, um, aside from the people that you get to work with, is that you get to work on. You get to take a small group of people uh, that are fully committed to a mission and have outsized positive effects. So, with a team of five individuals or. 12 or 20, whatever it may be, you can conduct an operation that um, that has strategic level impacts. And I love this idea of small groups of committed people working on big problems that matter and making a big difference. And so I realized that I could transition out of the military, take the uniform off, um, get a new tool set. I use business school as a way to transition mm-hmm. out. Um, but at the end of the day, 
I was going to find a way to work alongside a small committed team on big problems that, um, that I was passionate about. Sweet. And then uh, I think you went to Wharton. Is that right? So you came out of the military and you ended up going to Wharton business school. I did. Yes. Okay. And then, uh, and how many were you there? Four years, two years? What I didn't. Uh, the MBA programs two years, so I spent two years, two years in the in, in the business school there, and um, gotcha. you know, awesome experience. I would say most of this stuff went over my head. Uh, the right. accounting and the finance, and I still, if I look at a spreadsheet, I kind of break out in a hive a little <laughs> right. bit. Um, but it was it was awesome. I mean, I again, I got to trade out my tool set, learn from a whole bunch of different people that came from a variety of backgrounds in the business world, and. Um, and it was really great. It gave me the confidence and the ability to know that at some point I can start my own thing and, and have the skill set to do so. Uh, but one of the classes in particular that I took that really left a big impression on me was, wasn't was actually even in the business school. I audited an undergraduate class taught by a woman named Dr. Angela Duckworth. And Angela is a, a world-renowned researcher and scientist. She's known for um, her work um, around grit and grit being a determining factor for success, which um, is something that was important to me because nothing's ever really come easy. I've always had to just stick with things and work hard. Mm-hmm. Um, but I that pulled me into the class, but the class that she taught was actually an introduction to the field of positive psychology. Mm-hmm. And this was my first exposure to it. And what I loved about this course and that whole field, and um, much of it grew out of the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Dr. Martin Seligman, uh, it was in Penn, would come into the class. He's really the the champion and founder of this, of the modern field of positive psychology. Um, this whole field of research basically says, look, in any intervention, be it uh, medical, behavioral, health, or otherwise, there are really two sides to the equation. One side is, um, focuses on harm reduction. Can I minimize downside risk, avoid bad behaviors? It's the side of the equation that says stop doing or you know, avoid these things. This is like, we don't smoke, we don't you know, eat whatever. This is the, the program of avoidance. But the other side of the equation is, what are the things that I can be in pursuit of um, that are in line with the way that my brain and body are designed that help bring out the best in me that ultimately lead to a more flourishing life? And I just loved what they presented. Um, I loved it even more so because it was backed in all these evidence-based research studies and it was a very rigorous discipline. Um, But what I thought was really cool was a lot of what they talked about mapped to what I experienced in the teams. Mm -hmm. Now, I always say we have a different lexicon in the team, so you're not gonna hear SEALs talk a lot about gratitude or mindfulness or mm-hmm. you know these sorts of things but um, underlying that the practices are very much the same and they can unlock help us unlock uh, potential in our lives and um, so anyways that planted a small seed for me which eventually would grow into you know what became made for hmm. so so you get out of business school then um, what what so let's talk about made for what is made for what is that exactly? Yeah, so Made For is a program that um, I designed alongside uh, my co-founder, Blake McCoskey, and um, a gentleman named Dr. Andrew Huberman. Andrew is a neuroscientist out of Stanford. He leads our scientific advisory board, and we started working on this about five years ago now. Um, Andrew, um, Blake, and a number of other scientific advisors from Stanford and Harvard and National Institute of Mental Health all came together, and, and basically what we said is, can we make the science of well-being not only doable and actionable and interesting, but can we make it effective? And effective from the standpoint in that, can we help someone create lasting change um, so that they have, um, they feel the effects of their effort and they unlock a better life uh, through the process? So we got to work, it sounds very grandiose, we got to work and we started looking at what are all the things that are available? What is what does neuroscience ha- neuroscience have to say about the way that the brain changed? What does behavioral science have to say about the way that we adopt and um, learn new behaviors and new habits? What does positive psychology say about where we can direct our attention and effort that lead to a more flourishing life? Or um, where does physiology? What does physiology have to say about how does the body respond best to stimulus and are there things that we can do from a from a body standpoint that bring out the best in us? Um, so we brought all these experts together and we got to work and 
over the course of a year, we distilled down their research, their science, their um, their expertise into a program that's 10 months long. Um, and the program is really designed to help someone create not only better habits around well-being, so every month we focus on a different foundational habit. Um, these are things like hydration, gratitude, rest, nature, social connection, movement, breath. Um, so not only are we focusing on different habits, but the idea is can we use those habits as a way to help build a better mindset? And in the process of building a better mindset, help someone unlock the best uh, that's inside them and, and help them live a better life. And so that's really what the program is. And um, we've been we've been working with folks now for a few years. We've, we've served over 11,000 people to date, worked with uh, you know, you know, for over 40 plus companies, we're in 42 countries and it's been awesome. Yeah, that's very cool. And um, um, so, so it's 10 months, you, you say each month is kind of focused on a different thing. And so, you know, from start to finish, what, what are some of the, I guess, experiences people are having from kind of, uh, and then do they have a hell week in there? Is that, <laughs> is that, is that part of, it's like, okay, in month eight, let's put them through hell week. Let's just see what happens. Let's see how, how, how far they've come. If you really want to do the deal, but the, um, but so, so yeah, that's by the way, that's, that's, that's one of my favorite groups is when, um, a new company starts made for, and they, uh, they kind of announce it to their employees. Uh, and I, I, I usually I'll do a kickoff call with employees or whatnot. And so talking to a few hundred folks and, the the chief wellness officer or chro will come out and say okay so we're gonna we're gonna do made for for the, this next year we're really excited about it and here's this former navy seal to introduce it and um everyone their first thought is oh my god they're gonna make us like, <laughs> right. not sleep we're gonna not eat right. we're gonna be wet and cold and so right. uh, i always diffuse that and say this is not what made for is not seal training but um you know so I would say we focus on these foundational practices and, and these are things that our grandparents probably have all told us that, hey, this is good for you. But um, for one reason or another, maybe we've gotten disconnected from the capacity these practices have to unlock um, our full well-being potential. And so we help people and we start we help people understand the real benefits, but really the program is designed to get someone offline and into action around these small positive pursuits every day. And so the program really is delivered on maybe just a couple of minutes each day. Mm -hmm. So for instance, we focus on hydration. This, um, this bottle is, is a, a tool that we use oh. during the hydration month. And what we ask, what we ask our members to do is That's track funny. how much water you drink, uh -huh. over the course of 21 days um use this bottle and every time or, or another um uh, another bottle that you may have but every time that you finish a bottle move a bead on the bottle right and um at the end of the day write down how many bottles you drank and just write a short little reflection about how you felt that day right. um and so what happens is uh and and there's a lot that's underlying the program. So Andrew talks about neuroplasticity and the way that we can direct brain change after the age of 25. There's really two models and we follow and in, fall into this kind of small steps over time model, but we're bringing your attention to something that you're doing every day. We're creating some awareness around how that thing that you do um, is affecting you and what are those positive effects that are happening. And then we help reinforce that through a journaling prompt. So what we find with our members, and it doesn't matter how much someone drank prior to coming to made for how much water they drank uh or how you know what their habit looked like we find our members start to discover what works best for them and what their unique hydration requirements are but not only are they developing a better hydration habit and feeling the downstream effects of that that are positive but they're also starting to notice well when i pay attention to this one thing that i do I'm actually starting to pay attention to other things that I'm doing every day and creating awareness of how those are affecting me. So people are saying like, oh, I've noticed that I my my body's really stiff because I'm hunched over a desk for three hours at a time. And now I'm more aware of that. So I'm standing up and I'm stretching or I recognize that I wasn't present when I was eating. And now I'm more present and tuned to what I'm eating and making better decisions there. And so every month there are these, the, the, the topic that we're focused on, but underneath that and adjacent to that, um, some very real interesting transformations are occurring. And you start to see these habits stack on one another. And um, Andrew says it best. He says, you know, the goal of this program isn't for someone to get to the end and have a checklist of 10 
things right. that they have to do every day to like have a perfect morning or you know live their best day but rather the goal is to create a reflexive you that is closer in line to your best you so can you reflexively move through your day in such a way where you're being your own best teammate you're aware of what's affecting you whether people or your environment or actions you're taking uh you're finding ways to extend yourself grace and self-compassion you recognize that these small steps over time really do some to great effect and so um this is all part of the the mindset shift that occurs for our members as they're going through the program and that's awesome that's incredible and i i you know, I went, I looked at the kind of what the different segments are and totally agree with like hydration, breathing, you know, sleep. You know, we have a lot of people on the, come on the show. We talk about intermittent fasting and how that affects your, you know, your, and I, I'm not saying that's part of your program. I'm just, so we talk a lot about health stuff here because ultimately, you know, how do we help people leave, lead better lives is getting, getting them information and results, right? It's one thing to listen to this podcast and be, oh, that's nice for somebody else, but to actually then do it and be like, oh, wow, I actually do feel better when I breathe or when I get enough sleep or when I don't look at my cell phone, you know, an hour before bed or whatever, whatever the, and it's usually, I, I'm sure there would be new stuff in, you know, people go through your program, they're going to learn some new stuff, but there's probably a lot of just common sense stuff, right? I mean, it's like sleep, right? You just need good sleep. I mean, there's, right? And hydration, <laughs> you need to be more hydrated than you think you need to be, usually, I think. I mean, you take in more water than you probably, I think, it's just to your point, I think there's just not a lot of, I think just tracking it and starting to be aware of it, you start to go, oh yeah, I didn't drink enough water today. No wonder I'm tired or, right. You, it's, it's the awareness part of it. Is that part of the system? That's the, yeah, that, it's certainly part of it. And I, you know, something that we always um, talk about with our members at the outset of the program is, and I'm not, I'm not, an, I don't demonize technology. I'm not, you know, I have nothing against the modern world. I think it's great. There's a lot of good things that come from it, but um, oftentimes you get people coming in and they're so hyper focused and fixated on external metrics of success, whether mm -hmm. that's coming from um, an app on their phone telling right. them, hey, here's your score, here's how you feel, here's, here's how you whatever, to uh, maybe a device that they're wearing or um, a piece of technology outside themselves. They're just so focused externally that they've lost um, connection with what signals and cues their body is sending to them and how best they can respond in real time to perform better. And so that's really where the made for program shines. And the, the technical term for this is interoceptive awareness. Can you cultivate awareness to what your body's telling you and how to respond um, so that you can be better? So you can have more energy, mm -hmm. feel rested, all these sorts of things. And um, that's, we, we focus a lot of time on this interoceptive awareness side of things. Um, but at the same time, we, you know, we, we all know that sleep is good for us. We all know that water is good for us or that these are things that we need to survive. But, um, you know, when you tell someone that uh, when you are dehydrated on the order of one to 2%, so mm -hmm. um, one to 2% below the threshold of what your hydration requirements are, this is before the thirst trigger hits, right. um, you actually have start to have physical and cognitive impairments to your performance whether or not you're winning to it or not. So you take something like that, that's a little small thing and maybe you don't notice it today, maybe you don't notice it tomorrow. Over time, these small steps add up either in your favor mm -hmm. or not, right? So we take something like that and then you pair it with rest. And we all know that sleep is good for us, but what you might not realize is that um, if you are rolling over in the middle of the night and uh, you have to use the bathroom and you check your phone to see what time it is, a short dose of light from your device uh, in the middle of the night is enough to reset your circadian clock so that pretty soon you get out of entrainment. So you're not entrained to the natural light rhythms in your environment. And that, again, you might not notice it tomorrow. You might not notice it the next day, but six months from now, you're gonna start to, why am I so tired? Why am I so sluggish? Why am I just dragging through my day? So you start to have some awareness around how these things intersect and how they can stack up and actually create very real headwinds for um, for us to um, have agency over our well-being. So um, there are little things like that that people are gonna learn as they're going through the program. Um, but I'd say more than anything that we tell someone and what you know our advisors or scientists or in the discussions that we have as members are going through, um, what, what people learn there, 
the meat of this program is about small, consistent action over time. Right. And we all know that it doesn't matter. Small doesn't necessarily mean easy. It just means doable. Um, and we found a way to create a program and a system that gets someone to do the small steps over time. And that's where uh, the value is unlocked in this program. So do you send them a cookie after they win the reward or is it, <laughs> what, what do you, what do I get? No, like a, so the, <laughs> so, yeah. So again, the goal here is we want, we want people generating internal rewards and recognizing that mm -hmm. hey, they have more agency and control than they realize mm -hmm. and um, how these small actions and small ways direct your attention and effort can actually create rewards, recognize when you experience those and allow that to start to shift you from an inertia driven life to a momentum driven life where you're creating positive momentum and you um, have a little bit more control over where you're going. So um, we have we have things to help keep people on track and keep them engaged. And one of the things that I always like to say at the beginning of the program is that, look, it's not a matter of if, but when you are going to miss a rung at this program, you're going to fall short on a challenge, right. or yep. you're going to um, you're going to disengage for a period of time. Life gets a vote, and you're not a machine, and neither are Navy SEALs, right? We mm -hmm. all we all fall off track. Mm -hmm. That's okay. But this is a program not of perfection, but of progress. And how you guide yourself back on track when you're ready um, is more important than the fact that you ever ever went off track in the first place. So right. um, try to try to inoculate people against uh, against that. Yeah, totally. Consistency, consistency, consistency. Right. I mean, just it's like it, sometimes when I go to the gym, it's just like the wind was just showing up that day. Right. It may not be the best workout I've ever had in my life. I may only do it for a shorter amount of time. But for me, it's like, well, the wind was I just did it right. I could have opted not to come in and, or not to go do yeah. something today. So I I'm counting that as a win because that consistency over time builds the habit. Right. It's the habit that we're we're trying to entrain better habits, I would think, for our or at least personal habits. Right. Yeah, we, we always, our, our simple line is better habits, better mindset, better life. Oh, and good. so, um, and, and a part of that is recognizing that there is not one way, there is, doesn't, it's, there's not one way to eat. It's not intermittent fasting. It's right. not ketogenic. It's not um, paleo. It's not Whole30. There are many healthy dietary patterns. What you have to figure out is what works best for you. Right. There are some overarching principles to wellness. We explore those, but at the end of the day, our our intention and what we're working towards is to help someone become their own best guide, become familiar with the principles, but then also be comfortable exploring to discover what is right for them. Because again, you know, you hear on the marketplace, like you've got to do this, or this is the perfect thing, or this is the optimal morning routine. And like, it's all garbage, right? Throw it all out. And you, you need to focus on what's right for you today and what's effective for you. So I have a, f a funny side note here. The, um, so we've got this, uh, we've got two dogs. One of them's a uh, little, Aust it's an Australian cattle dog, but it's, we got it from the pound. So who knows if it's an actual Australian cattle dog, but they're made for herding. Right. And, and like, it looks kind of like a dingo in the face and, and this dog, a little female dog, she's seven or eight years old, but she is an escape artist because she was a stray. So she will, she won't let anybody touch her once she gets out of the yard, but literally she'll jump. I've seen her jump a five foot fence. Like it was not just from a standstill. I don't know how, and she's not, but probably I, I don't, she probably weighs 20 pounds. She may be, you know, 12 inches high, maybe 14 or something. Um, but she, so our neighborhood, it became a funny thing in our neighborhood that uh, all the neighbors would start posting on Facebook pictures of the dog, right, at different locations. <laughs> and so it became this thing. And it was kind of, you know, it was funny, but not funny because they're like, oh, look, Molly's out again. And then, you know, they'd post it like, go get your dog. And so, but she would always come home. She's a stray, but she also has hyper anxiety. So she always comes home because she can't be away for them. And so one of them had posted, uh, you, should, you should get on a bike and run her. And I was like, I hadn't ridden a bike for years. In fact, I, the bike in our garage is actually from my wife. And, you know, it's probably 15, 20 year old bike. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to try that. So that dog now has me riding that bike probably at least <laughs> four or five times a week. But I do it first thing in the morning. And actually, I'm, I like 
just going for that ride and getting the fresh air and kind of breathing. Amazing. But I, to, to your point about finding things that work, I was like, yeah, the dog has basically, and the dog loves it too. She runs full out. We ride probably, I don't know, three miles or something like that. It's not that far, but that dog runs full out the whole time. So I'm motivated to ride faster because I got to keep up with the dog and try to beat her home. But, <laughs> but I'm, I, I guess I've, I, it, it's just funny to me that I'm kind of using life, I guess, to it, ultimately I feel better when I go for that bike ride first thing in the morning. Right. So now the dog is just, yeah. you know, the, the dog I'm writing, I was writing it for the dog. Now, now the dog's running for me. Um, but it would, I had to you know, rethink that and, and be like, yeah, that works for me. And now I know it works for me because I tried it. You know, some things I try and I, they don't work, but it, it's something small, but still impactful, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to relate kind of back to what you're talking about. It, it wasn't, it's not a big deal to get on a bike and ride around my neighborhood. But at the same time, it has had a po very positive effect on my mental state in the morning. I, you know, I kind of feel more, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm getting to race, I'm getting to win. Sometimes most of the days I lose, but, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 in, it's engaging and it's fun for me and it works for me. Somebody else is going to be like, yeah, that, I don't want to do that, right? Yeah. Well, I think what's amazing about that example is that you start to see how what, what might be considered considered at first glance, discrete areas of focus mm -hmm. can actually combine to become one thing. And so in that morning bike ride, um, you're moving, you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're moving your muscles, you're moving your body. Um, you're, you're engaging in what Andrew would call self-generated optic flow. Mm -hmm. Um, you're getting morning sunlight, you're getting exposure to nature. Uh, you're, um, maybe engaging with, you know, having some gratitude for your dog. Right. There's all sorts of things that are coming into that. And then you come back and, and pretty soon you have this, this thing that you did that has now changed maybe the trajectory of your day. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and it seems like such a simple thing, but, um, there's, there's some powerful, uh, some powerful effects by simple practices. Yeah, That's and, amazing. And literally it takes, I mean, depending on the day, 10, 15, 20 minutes. I mean, from the time I leave the door, cause we're just riding the neighborhood, right? As fast as I can ride. So the dog gets <laughs> exercise. But it, for, and for me personally, I know this about myself, I'm competitive enough that if I didn't have the dog, I wouldn't ride the bike. It would be like, for me, it's like, like I take joy in watching the dog run and I take joy in like watching her have to stop and go to the bathroom. And so I speed up as, go as fast as I can because she'll catch me in a heartbeat. I mean, so it's this whole game, right? I'm playing games as I'm riding along and for other people, they, you know, just getting out and I'm sure probably walking and and, or whatever, yeah. running or, or just doing something in the morning. You know, most of the people when we've asked them that, that come on the show typically have some type of morning ritual that sets kind of sets the day or sets the tone for the day so that they don't get hijacked. And that's, we've talked about that a lot with different guests. It's kind of like if I'm more um, thoughtful and more um, intentional with the first things I do in the morning, then typically that's going to give me a better trajectory throughout the day. Whereas if I just mm -hmm. don't get enough sleep and the kids wake me up too early or whatever, something happens and then I just start into the day, you know, you kind of get what you get and you're not necessarily, you know, and, and is that part of the kind of the program of kind of how to shift your mindset or get that early morning mindset shift? That, that is, um, that's certainly part of it. And it, it's also, um, Again, it's coming back to this. There's not one way to do that. Right. There's a, a way that maybe is best for you. And part of this process is discovering what that is for you. But um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm always, it's funny. I'm always very critical when, whenever I see or someone shares, oh, did you see this so-and-so influencer has this new morning routine? What do you think about it? I'm like, uh, if it works for them, that's great. I'm like, right. but you shouldn't read that. Like, that's not, you know, figure out what works for you. Um, so, uh, yeah, but I think, uh, you know, if you can, if you can find a way to start your day, I, I, used to, I boxed in college. And so there's, you can either be, you know, back on your heels or on the balls of your feet. And if you're back on your heels, you're kind of catching whatever comes your way. And right. sometimes I know if I, if I wake up early and, um, I mistakenly grab my phone and look at it, and I'm, I'm met by a barrage of mm -hmm. texts and emails and work stuff and calendar dings and all that very quickly I'm back on my heels. I'm like, oh man, what else is this day gonna throw at me? As opposed to if I can, you know, roll out of my bed and walk outside and mm -hmm. you know, take some time and really kind of think about how am I gonna lean into this day, then it just, it shifts my perspective on the day and, and how um, how I engage it, so. Yeah, I totally, totally, totally agree. And I agree that for everybody, it's gonna be different. It depends on where you live and what you do and societal norms and all that other stuff. But, you know, find the thing that, 
find the thing that makes you feel good and then do more of that. And by, by, by that, I don't mean eat a like large thing of fries. I mean, find the thing that truly <laughs> makes you feel good at a soul level. Right. Um, and then what, so what drives you in this work? Obviously you're passionate about it. You've created a whole business around it, but why does it matter to you to help other people? Um, I don't know whether you want to call it transform or, or have a happier life or lead a more positive life, but what, what drives you, I guess, what's the win for you personally? Yeah, I mean, I, I've i always been interested in, in human potential and the mm-hmm. uh, capacity that we all have inside ourselves to um, to do more, to, to, to um, yeah, uh, you know, affect, you know, affect change and, and affect greater change. And so one of the things that got me really excited about working on Made For that my, my co-founder and I, co-founder and I aligned on in the beginning is this idea that a better world begins with the best you. Mm-hmm. And that if we can help individuals show up and be better teammates to themselves and show up a little bit better in their lives, they're, the compounding effects of that are that they're going to bring out the best in their families, in their communities. And, and that seemed to be a very cool thing to work on, a cool positive mission. And I think so often, and it doesn't matter if it's COVID or, um, politics or warfare or what, there's always something going on and mm-hmm. it's very easy to focus on all of the bad stuff and to get carried away by um, all of the things that are outside of our control but in spite of that there there we still have to navigate the environment that we find ourselves in and it just it's cool to help people realize that they have this hidden potential inside themselves that they can show up better and show Show up in small ways and that in doing so they're not only going to bring out the best in themselves but in everyone around them so oh. um that excites me yeah good that's a worthy cause and a worthy purpose and i knew it was inside you but i just wanted to i think i like to kind of he- hear all that stuff so people can connect with that and understand and you know i i love you know when we have people that come on the show um you know all of them are living their purpose and living intentionally and leaning into you know what the God, you know, the gifts that God gave them. And so I just, I, I, I hope that, you know, when people watch the videos, when they listen to the podcast, that, that inspires them to do the same, right? So part of it is the program that you're doing, but part of it is that you're doing it because it matters. You know, it matters to you at a deep level to help people and that lights you up. And I think the more of us in the world that can lean in to doing stuff that lights us up, it just naturally inspires others, right? It's kind of like once you're um, when you're around positive, inspiring people, all of a sudden, guess what? You feel positive and you feel, I mean, for the most part, you feel positive and, and inspired. So I think it's really cool. And, and uh, that's why we love having people come on. And, and hopefully that spreads the message of what they're doing because we, we just need more of that. I agree that there's a lot of negativity and divisiveness. And it's like, well, then you got to change your focus, right? If, if you're seeing a lot of that, then Focus on the things that you that make you feel. It's kind of like eating food or sleeping or hydra- or any of these things, right? It's what are you feeding into your consciousness? What are you feeding into your brain? What are you feeding into to your being? Because you are, whether you're doing it actively or passively, you're the only one that can that can control what you're consuming. There, there is no one else, right? I mean, that's personal responsibility. But if you're watching. You know, I don't care what news program you're watching. If you're watching that very often, every day, guess what? You're going to have a level of negativity that's not <laughs> that's that's not what you probably want to experience, and you don't even know it's happening. It's kind of like you get conditioned to kind of feeling not great, right? To, to the yeah. point you made about rolling over and seeing your phone first thing in the morning, there could be things on there that that aren't what you want to see first thing in the morning for your mindset. So you got to make those things. Habitual. I finally just got rid of email off my phone altogether. I said, I, I don't want to even be, oh, wow. I, I'm to it. Well, actually I've not had email for about three years now on, on any of my devices. Um, because I just got to the point of, a, I found myself, it was like, it would hijack me in the middle of being with my kids. Right. You, yeah. you know, I'm giving my kids a bath and I'm checking my email and it's just, and you know, it's something would come through that I wasn't happy about or something. It's like, what am I doing? I don't, I can't, I'm not going to address this at six o'clock at night. This isn't something I need to know about something at work. I mean, if I'm going to get bad news, let me get it tomorrow morning when I can do something about it, not tonight. Cause then I'll just lay awake worrying about it all night. So I just finally said, forget it. I'm not going to do email on my phone anymore. Um, so yeah. that was just one of the choices I had to make. And I quit watching the news, gosh, five, five more, five or more years ago. So yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I, um, it's, you know, uh, it's, it's kind of cool 
how a small change like that can actually bring you much closer to the things that you care most about. Right. And, you know, whether it's your children or your passion or your, you know, your, your purpose, um, I think these small changes can, can very quickly, um, bring you much closer to the things that you care most about. And I think oftentimes we hear from our members coming in that they've lost hope that they've tried everything under the sun and they 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 thought they at one point could change but they can't or right. they can't realize the, the the bigger goal that they're after and what what fires me up is when you help someone realize that like no you have the capacity to to create the world that you want to make the change that you want and it doesn't have to come from you know you hear things like mission or vision or you know you know bigger purpose and sometimes for people that can seem really daunting right that, well i you know i i have this job and it, it's just a job and so I, I i don't have room for that but what i can tell you is that um everyone has room for that it doesn't matter what you're doing that you can find ways to live your mission and your vision and do so in a way that builds you up and builds those around you up in the process. And it's never too late to start. So we've got, we've had members um, as young as 17, all the way up to our oldest members, 92 years of age. Oh, wow. And the 92 year old recognized that uh, gentleman just lost his wife um, this mm -hmm. past year, recognizes that he has to find a way to get the most out of life today and that um, the effort is worth it. And so um, for anyone that's listening, I would just tell you, it doesn't matter if you do made for or you don't, um, it's never too late to start and change is possible. Start small, stay curious and recognize that um, in the process, you got to be kind to yourself. You got to be your own best teammate, give yourself grace and uh, and you'll surprise yourself how, how big of a transformation you can make or change you can make and um yeah that's uh, that's what it's all about awesome love it people can get a hold of you at get made for dot, or go to the program at get made for dot com and are there other avenues uh, to reach out social media yeah, you can you can find us on instagram at okay. made for just uh, at m-a-d-e-f-o-r you can find me at uh, made for underscore pat uh, once a month we host a, a public um, uh, virtual discussion with a leading scientist or scholar or clinician around the science of wellness and potential. Um, so check us out. You can you can join into those live and always really great conversations. And um, and yeah, so look forward to, to hearing from you and uh, mm -hmm. hope to support some of you at, at some point. Yeah, no, I love that. And uh, certainly um, as things evolve, we'd love to have you come back on the show periodically and kind of update us on the work and how it's progressing and what you're doing and anything we can help uh, uh, help sponsor or promote, we would, we would love to do that because we love to uh, highlight good work that's happening in the world and we need more and more of it. So thank you so much for coming on the show today and we appreciate uh, the conversation. Amazing, Matt. Thank you. One alibi. Um, if there is a, if, if anyone listening is a military member, veteran or military dependent, we offer the program for free for that community. So you can oh, go awesome. onto our homepage, go down to the bottom. There's a military section and, uh, and just um, follow that and, uh, and you can get the program for free. It was, it was important to me that we continue to serve those that are, are serving um, and sacrificing for the rest of us. So amazing. Thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. And thank you for your service to our country. That's, that's your, you're an amazing human being, and it was certainly an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. Awesome. Thanks so much, Matt. Enjoyed it. Take care. Bye. Thank you for being a part of the Bright Vibe podcast. For more information, go to brightvibe.com. That's B-R-I-T-E, vibe, B-I-B-E.com. Thank you for listening. <laughs>